much. And um, thank you all for running up here after the demonstration in time to, uh, <clears throat> in time to hear what I've got to say. Um, so, yes, as you can see, the title that I've used on this slide is not quite the same as what you've seen in the, um, in the program, but don't worry, the topic will be. Um, I realise that the audience here is mainly scientific professionals, and therefore I should really focus on the more hardcore biology that's involved in what I do. And that is, as you will see, mainly focused on what we might call the relatively short term of combating aging. Um, what I like to think of as the next perhaps 20 or 30 years, during which I think we have a chance of achieving perhaps a 30 or so year extension in longevity, postponement of the ill health of aging, in other words. Um, and as the introduction briefly outlined, the reason that I'm focusing on that, and yet the reason I talk about decreasing aging altogether, is because I firmly believe that once we have gained that degree of control over aging, enough to rejuvenate people well enough to postpone the age-related ill health by 30 years, we will have done the hard part. We will have bought enough time to be able to improve those therapies um, a bit more over the next 20 or 30 years, so that the same people who benefited from the fairly good but imperfect therapies in the first place will be able to benefit from improved therapies 20 or 30 years down the line and further improved therapies 20 or 30 years after that and so on with the result that the ill health of old age should be uh, able to be postponed indefinitely and that's why I get to be able to talk about the possibility of living into four digit lifespan which is the sort of amount of time that we would live today if the only things we died of were the things that young adults die of today. In other words, if the risk of death each year did not increase as we got older, which is the ultimate consequence that would be achieved by indefinitely postponing the decline of old age. So um, this is going to be about the how of aging, but I thought I would have one slide about why. Um, uh, I mean, let's face it, in contrast to Heinz Wolf's talk just before where he spent a little while talking about um, ideas that were plausible but um, completely false, this is a talk about an idea that's extremely implausible but yet completely true, and um, uh, the question is why, and of course the answer is here. Uh, at the end of Heinz's talk he talked about the uh, technologies that he helped to develop which make being like someone on the right uh, less grim than it otherwise would be, but it doesn't make it very much less grim, let's face it. It would be rather better if we stayed like this, and that's the fact. So, um, before I go any further, I should probably just mention that there has been a small update to my affiliation. Um, in the introduction, you heard that I was the Chief Science Officer and Chairman of the Methuselah Foundation, which is a US registered charity. Um, actually, a couple of months ago, the Methuselah Foundation effectively split in two, and I am now the Chief Science Officer of the new foundation called the SAMS Foundation, which is focused solely on the development and dissemination of the sorts of therapies I'm going to be telling you about today. Um, we do in-house work as well as extramural work <coughs> um, globally. We're essentially a funding body. Um, I spend most of my time going out, getting people to give me money that I can give out again to people like you to get work done, um, and that's why I give all these talks. Um, so, <clears throat> this is basically what I'm going to say over the next half hour. First of all, I'm going to talk about why I can uh, conclude such outrageous things about what we might be able to do with longevity and with aging in the foreseeable future. And I'm going to start by talking from the, if you like, the 30,000 foot level and explaining the, the plausible approaches to combating aging and why one particular approach is so much better than all the others. Then I'm going to move on to some details, some real biology, and discuss the structure of that approach. And in the third part of the talk, I'm going to move on to even greater detail about just one of those seven components of the overall plan. The reason I'm going to focus on just one of them is simply because the plan is extremely detailed and there's an awful lot to say, far more than I could possibly say in this talk. And then right at the end, I'm just going to talk a little bit about how you might be able to make a difference. So I'm going to start with this. Um, what do I mean, repair versus retardation? Well, in order to um, 
In order to tackle any hard problem, there's one thing that you obviously have to do at the beginning, which is to state the problem in the appropriate way, in a way that is conducive to being able to think appropriately about solutions. And there are many, many different definitions of aging out there. But this is the one that I like most. Um, it essentially starts from something that we all, all essentially know already, namely that metabolism causes pathology. In other words, that, being, that aging is a consequence of being alive in the first place. Um, but this, of course, is split into two in the statement I'm giving on this slide. What I'm doing here is I'm defining the term damage. This is the way that I'm going to be using the word damage for the next half hour. I'm going to be using it in this very precise way. Damage is going to be the set of intermediates between the stuff that keeps us going from one day to the next and the stuff that eventually does us in. A set of molecular and cellular intermediates between metabolism and pathology. So these are essentially um, side effects of metabolism that accumulate and that eventually, when they accumulate a sufficient abundance, start to get in the way of metabolism and stop it from working so well. So the reason that that definition is useful is best outlined, I think, using this little diagram. So I've got metabolism causing damage and causing pathology down here. And classically, there are two different ways that people have thought about the possibility of doing anything about all of this. One of them I'm going to call the geriatrics approach. And the approach here is essentially to treat old people, to wait until <coughs> the pathologies of aging are beginning to emerge and try and slow them down, try and hold back the sands of time so that they progress less rapidly than they otherwise would, thus, of course, postponing the age at which they will um, become sufficiently advanced to be problematic and um, cause diseases and the risk of death and all that sort of stuff. Um, and that's all very well. It's certainly an approach. The other approach that people have favoured, I'm going to call the gerontology approach. And the starting point here is essentially the concept that prevention is better than cure, which of course is a pretty reliable concept in most cases. The idea here is that if we actually could clean up metabolism, if we could in some way um, reduce the rate at which metabolism lays down these various molecular and cellular side effects in the first place, then that might be an easier route towards postponing the age at which pathology becomes problematic because, of course, it would slow down the rate at which damage accumulates and therefore delay the point at which damage gets to the level that causes pathology. All right, so there are these two approaches, and they both sound pretty promising at first. But they aren't. This is why the geriatrics approach is not promising. You all know this. You don't have to be a biologist to understand that aging is extremely miserable. There are an awful lot of things that go wrong with people as they get older. They exacerbate each other. The whole thing is terribly chaotic and horrible. And this basically means that the geriatrician is going to be doing something, but not very much. The geriatrics approach is better than nothing, but it's not much better. And in fact, we can go further. Because the geriatrician is attacking the consequences of damage, in other words, because the precursors of the target of the geriatrician are continuing to accumulate, we have the problem that the geriatrician's job is getting harder and harder as the patient gets older and older. So ultimately, it doesn't matter how good we get at geriatrics, it's never going to be all that much better than nothing. So that leaves the gerontology approach. Unfortunately, the gerontology approach has a problem as well, which all of you who are biologists will be very familiar with. Metabolism is rather complicated. This is a, um, uh, a simplified diagram of a small subset of what we know about how, how the cell works. Um, and of course, that's bad enough, but the really bad news, as all of you know, is that this is a simplified diagram of a small subset of what we know about how metabolism works, which is completely and absolutely dwarfed by the astronomical amount that we don't know about how metabolism works, even leaving aside all the stuff that we don't even know that we don't know. So, um, so, so, so basically, you know, it's all a bit hopeless, really. The idea of actually trying to clean up a machine that we, about which we understand so pathetically little is, you know, really a little bit of a pipe dream. So, why am I here? How do I get away with the outrageous claim that we can do something about aging, let alone that we can do an awful lot about aging? Well, in order to get going on, on why, I think I will start with an analogy, which is 